Hello YouTube, Shadow Hero 90 here, and welcome to my show, Sexism in Movies and TV. You see, there is a reason why I do this show. Now, despite the fact that a lot of the stuff I review is for adults, a lot of the stuff I rip apart is aimed at kids. And truth be told, boys do not get good role models out of these shows. In fact, growing up on schlock like this actually runs the risk of your typical young man growing up with very low self-esteem and possibly coming to hate himself when he reaches adulthood. And that's why I do this show, to expose the hypocritical and unbelievable level of hatred thrown at both boys and men through both movies and TV, in the hopes of making a difference. Okay, in the season 4 premiere of Sexism in Movies and TV, I'm gonna be tackling the much-hated episode, Boys vs. Girls from Teen Titans. The episode starts off with Robin, Cyborg, and Beast Boy acting like arrogant, pompous jackasses and then saying boys are better than girls using very warped logic. I mean, they don't even use real world logic. Like the fact that men built the modern world and the only way a woman can succeed in our modern world is to gripe, complain, and throw a protest which is, well, to be blunt, a, a modern day protest is nothing more than an over-glorified temper tantrum. But the wording that boys are more handsome than girls doesn't really pan out. Women are not supposed to be handsome, to the best of my knowledge. So yeah, Robin, Cyborg, and Beast Boy are pretty much straw men in this episode. After Starfire and Raven say something, Robin says that girls have cooties. So they have a competition. And since this is modern day writing, the girls win only because the story demands it. Or maybe because Robin, Cyborg, and Beast Boy aren't exactly the equals of Batman, Superman, Green Lantern, The Flash, Shazam, etc. After winning, Starfire and Raven gloat, and Cyborg and Beast Boy decide they want to become girls. And in response to this, Robin finds some actual cooties and exposes Raven and Starfire to them. And then, as a threat to get rid of the disease, Raven and Starfire chase Robin around until they have him cornered. Until he snaps and agrees to use the cootie catcher on them to get rid of the disease. After losing to 
Raven and Starfire, we actually get an image of Wonder Woman shredding a Superman t-shirt and a Batman t-shirt. I, and that, I really gotta say, that's in bad taste. And yes, this is a pretty good representation of this episode and why it's hated so much. The reason that the boys lost is because one, Robin starts off as a sidekick. Beast Boy, a member of the Doom Patrol. All these guys, the three of them, are betas. Replace them with these guys, put Wonder Woman on the girls team, and the girls team would have definitely lost for sure, I guarantee you. Especially since the episode Gorilla that aired a year before this piece of crap did indeed establish that the Titans are scared of making Batman mad. And the episode ends with Robin, Cyborg, and Beast Boy apologizing, but say that only a boy could apologize on that level, implying that these guys are still douchebags even after they've been humbled. Which is kind of a, it's really similar to the King of the Hill episode. Uh-oh, Canada. Just replace Canada with boys and America with girls. You get the exact same story of bigotry. And now here's a little trivia on this shit fest. After the girls win the competition, a picture of Wonder Woman is seen shredding a Batman shirt. It was critically panned because of sexism. Hello YouTube, Shadow Hero 90 here, and welcome to my show, Sexism in Movies and TV. You see, there is a reason why I do this show. Now, despite the fact that a lot of the stuff I review is for adults, a lot of the stuff I rip apart is aimed at kids. And truth be told, boys do not get good role models out of these shows. In fact, growing up on schlock like this actually runs the risk of your typical young man growing up with very low self-esteem and possibly coming to hate himself when he reaches adulthood. And that's why I do this show, to expose the hypocritical and unbelievable level of hatred thrown at both boys and men through both movies and TV in the hopes of making a difference. I know that this isn't a TV show or a movie, but in this episode of Sexism in Movies and TV, I'm going to be ripping apart the um, sexist commercial produced by Gillette 
Okay, one, they are complete idiots who have jumped on the toxic masculinity bandwagon. And two, they're insulting their core audience. Or in this case, core demographic. The people who watch this commercial that this is supposed to be advertising their product to, they are outwardly insulting them. Eleven seconds in and we see a loser being chased by a horde of bullies. In the past, bullies were nothing more than an obstacle and the truth is, is that I'm pretty sure Gillette doesn't know a single fucking thing about bullies. If the weak little wimp here just runs away and takes it, then the bullies will be convinced that they can get away with it time and time again. We were actually told the truth that the only way to get rid of a bully is to stand up to him. And we also were told the truth, not these lies, that if you just sit back and take it, then the bully will just keep harassing you, beating you up, and essentially cramming his fist down your throat for fun because he knows that he's gonna get away with that. In Elf's second season, they did an episode called Hit Me With Your Best Shot about bullying. And in this episode, Willie beats up the father of the bully who was picking on Brian. Now, this was meant to be satirical because Willie, at the end, well, he kind of says that what he did was wrong, even though this guy was being a jerk and the joke of it was that Willie himself was setting a bad example for his son by not doing anything. The bully was the one who started it by insulting the mother, calling her fat, old, and dumb. And Willie may have been the one who hurled the first punch, but he it was coming from a good place. As the audience, we knew it was satirical and that the joke is that Willie is actually setting a bad example for Brian by acting in this manner. Willie actually stood up to the bully or in this case, the father of the bully, which in real life is the right thing to do. If you do not, you'll end up getting the crap kicked out of you. 16 seconds in, and they instantly mention cyberbullying. Cyberbullying, as far as I'm aware of, is more of a female problem than it is a male problem. And a male bully is more likely to punch you in the face than a female bully. And unless this is foreshadowing, Gillette releasing 
razors to sh spe made to shave women's leg hairs. I don't really see why this should even be in the ad. What's the first thing that you think someone will tell a kid who's being bullied and they'll say tell a t tell a teacher the reality is is that a teacher cannot do anything to protect someone against a bully realistically they may be able to protect the weak little nerds in school but in places like social media the neighborhood, or any other urban area, especially if the bully lives close to the nerd, if the bully tells the teacher, they will get punished, but at a certain point, the bully is going to track down the nerd and beat the ever-living fuck out of him. 20 seconds in, and there are a bunch of TV clips of women getting catcalled. Yeah, I would say that is kind of rude, but I'm pretty sure that women calling men pigs constantly and you know, jumping on this whole toxic masculinity thing is a lot more ruder. I mean, feminists have treated men like garbage since the 1960s. That's far more impolite than catcalling. 29 seconds in, and... We already, we instantly get a joke about rich guys who cheat on their wives with their female employees. Okay, in a previous episode of Sexism in Movies and TV, I debunked something similar to this. I debunked the whole men can cheat on their wives thing. Because the truth is they can't. And yeah, 29 seconds in, we already got a joke shoving that myth down our throats with this guy who clearly had sex with this woman cheating on his wife. And shit like this is what led to the Me Too movement. And if you haven't been keeping up with the corporate world, the ultimate backlash of the Me Too movement was men, essentially the type that this commercial is insulting, actually banning women, i.e. leeches like this bitch, from the workplace. But hey, Gillette, if you want to scare all the CEOs into not hiring women, while at the same time trying to please those same women, then go ahead. 40 seconds in, and they say that we're constantly making excuses using the old line, boys will be boys, talking about sexual allegations, 
an obvious allusion to the Me Too movement. Like I said before, the Me Too movement is turning the workplace upside down. And eventually, these corporations who do a lot for us are going to want every single woman kicked out of its workforce. They're not going to hire women, and in a possible future, possibly, this might happen, if some feminist cunt decides that she's going to sue a corporation for not hiring her, they will countersue, take all the examples and reasons as to why they wouldn't hire her, and win the case in court. 55 seconds in, and we get our first traitor, Terry Crews, a former NFL player. And by him saying these exact words, men need to hold other men accountable, implying rape, actually gives the uh, the false implication that men don't hold each other accountable when it comes to rape. Believe me, that one is a load of shit. 58 seconds in, and this beta male jackass shames this guy with a camcorder for asking this attractive girl to smile. Nothing sexual was even implied. And I have two answers for this one. One, sex sells. Answer two comes in the form of a question. If this was the other way around and some woman with a camcorder wanted to film some muscle-bound man creature who's just wearing a pair of boxer shorts, I don't think that some beta female pig would get upset about it. So yeah, there's a lot of hypocrisy in this one. Okay, one minute and four seconds in, and they comment that even talking one minute and four seconds in, and they imply through their words by saying, say the right thing, that even talking to a woman is somehow sexual harassment. And it is kind of racist that the man they imply is, is the aggressor is white, and the man who just jumps in front of them saying, hey, stop, is a black guy. But then again, we're living in 2019, where the jackass liberal media has brainwashed the idiot public into thinking every white man is a racist, sexist monster. And then this beta jacket says, oh, not cool, not cool. He didn't even know what the guy was going to say. Imagine saying this in real life. If this happened in real life and the white guy decked this black jackass, I'm pretty sure the white guy would be in the right, even though our asshole fake news media would be more than willing to paint this white guy as a monster, even though technically this is kind of the black guy harassing the white guy. 
Okay, one minute and 16 seconds in, we got a black guy getting his daughter to say that she's strong. And then we get various... And then these two boys who are roughhousing, the dads jump in and pull them off. It really sounds like Gillette wants girls to grow up to be boys and boys to grow up to be girls. One minute and 32 seconds in and they're impl and they say the boys of today will be the men of tomorrow implying that we're setting a bad influence for little boys. Yes, this is a crappy piece of toxic masculinity propaganda. And then it says, it's only by challenging us to do more. Do more is a very good question. How do we do more? Maybe do more could include think for your goddamn self. And then they say we are taking action at bet that the best men can be dot org. Bullshit. This is the worst men can be. This is nothing more than Gillette hopping on to the toxic masculinity bandwagon. And you want to know the truth? Nothing about toxic masculinity is toxic. Nothing about masculinity is toxic, period. Another harsh truth is the fact that toxic femininity you know, the inverse of toxic masculinity, the one that we're all told doesn't exist. Well, the truth is, toxic femininity began when the Dark Ages ended, and women have been toxic ever since. From the end of the bloody Dark Ages to 2019, the female gender has been 100% toxic and fucked up. Gillette. Fuck them. Hashtag boycott Gillette. Okay, I'm just going to start this one out by saying... When Rick and Morty aired the episode Raising Gazorpazorp, I truly felt betrayed. But when Boruto aired their fourth episode, that was way worse. That one made me feel like my dad had just shot me in the back. For no reason. And it's not the typical betrayal. Because. This writing is completely level one. This is coming from some. This is coming from a source that should definitely know better. When I went after this show in a previous episode of Sexism in Movies and TV, I really did basically say the same exact thing. That I watch shows like this because they are better than the majority of stuff on Western TV. And when I said that, I mean they actually avoid pulling stunts like this. But this is coming from Boruto, 
which is a spin-off of Naruto. And Naruto is ja is a Japanese anime. Something that should definitely know better. That being said, you under you will understand why they should know better when I go into the review. The Boys vs. Girls episode of Boruto, episode 4. You gotta be kidding me on this one. I mean, like I said, Japanese anime, you're supposed to be above this! You're supposed to be goddamn better than this! Doing a Boys vs. Girls episode is one of the most hacked, pathetic, done-to-death, sexist things you can imagine. And believe me, it's just like Boys vs. Girls on Teen Titans Go. They essentially turn all of the male characters into jackass straw men and weaken them just so the girls can win. It starts with Konohamaru, who was Naruto's sidekick in the original, showing the students at Ninja Academy how to use the summoning jutsu. So far, so good. And for some reason, all the girls in Boruto's class have a crush on him, because he's an adult, I guess. Even though Naruto never did this, this plotline is contrived as all goddamn fuck. It is forced as hell. Everyone on the internet who has their head up their ass and don't realize how bad this episode really is focuses on the ending with the appearance of Mitsuki. No one really knows that this episode is so bad and the story is so forced that it probably should have ended with the characters breaking the fourth wall saying not to take any of this seriously. <coughs> Spit bucket. So, I'm going to give you a little rundown of this piece of crap. So, to make it shorter, Boruto calls Konohamaru Big Brother Konohamaru as opposed to Sensei, which makes him mad. Boruto says that he could use the summoning jutsu too. And since Sasuke successfully taught Boruto the Chidori, which is usually a forbidden jutsu exclusive to him and Kakashi, or in this case anyone with the Sharingan, the idea of Boruto using the summoning jutsu is very likely. In fact, he actually gets it right when he does use it in the competition in the episode. The only reason it went wrong was the class representative infecting the animal with the Hashirama cell. Which we do find out is an illegal weapon. And then... Pretty much after all the girls chew out Boruto, this fat pig Chojo shows up and essentially calls him insecure, which is more or less her projecting. 
because she's so fat, it's not likely that any any boy in the Leaf Village would want to date her. Boruto takes the summoning scroll and tries to summon a snake, but it doesn't work. Sadara, who in this episode we find out is a massive hypocrite, gets upset saying Boruto is the reason why their class has such a bad reputation, as in picking fights like he did in the last episode, but she secretly enjoyed because it was awesome, and Boruto only did that to stick up for his friend. That's what Sadara's doing right now, sticking up for her friend, making her a fucking hypocrite. The whole thing just degenerates into them batting male and female stereotypes that aren't really true. This whole thing that could have been blown over in the span of, say, a week, is gotten Boruto so worked up that he doesn't even want to acknowledge that he's friends with Sadara. And I don't blame him on that one. I wouldn't want to be friends with a cunt like that. Then, in the cafeteria, Chojo and Sadara show up early just to get the majority of yakisoba rolls, just to set Boruto up so that Sadara can insult him. Sadara distracts Boruto, and it's actually funny when she says that he should let her have the last yakisoba roll, because that's what a gentleman would do. Here's the thing. She is not acting like a lady. If there are rules to chivalry, and one of them is if a female doesn't act like a lady, the guy doesn't have to act like a gentleman, and Sadara, throughout the series, doesn't act like a lady at, at any point. She acts like a second-rate boy. And seeing this sends Boruto into a rage that almost got him into a fight with Sadara. You know, if they actually just let N Boruto kick Sadara's ass, one, that would be good and interesting, and the fans would probably be a little lighter on this show. But no, since this is a boys versus girls episode, they have to flanderize all the men just to make the women look good. Then they're interrupted by their idiot teacher Shino. Okay, I'm going to stop for one second and say... Shino was really smart in the first two series. Going so far as to give him a mental power of two in the card game. Shikamaru had a mental power of four. And it was stated in the show that he had a genius IQ of 200. Therefore, Shino should have an IQ of 100. And I kind of have this odd feeling that someone with a 100 IQ would be smart enough to know that what he is about to say is a bad idea. He proposes a game of capture the flag, and 
the stakes he puts on it are insane. He should know better. He says that if the girls win, the boys will be subservient to the girls. If the bo And those stakes are, if the boys win, the girls will be subservient to the boys. And if the girls win, the boys will be subservient to the girls. That is insane. And probably vile... And, and and probably violates his authority in a lot of ways. How this guy hasn't been fired is beyond me. Okay, I'll spare you the details and tell you how it plays out. Since this is a girls versus boys episode, the girls win by doing next to nothing because all the men, and, or in this case boys, are flanderized just so the girls can win. If this was an actual fist fight, yeah, Boruto and his side would demolish the girls. But, since Boruto saved Chojo's life as, as opposed to getting the flag, the girls let them off the hook, the boys learn respect for the girls, and Boruto takes them out for hamburgers. Do I even need to comment on how screwed up this ending is? How about, before I dignify that with an answer, I will, you know, point out all of the effed up things in this shit show. 1. Shino never had a rival. He doesn't know that rivalries are strictly two characters fighting each other over and over. That's how rivalries work in the world of Naruto. But, since Shino's an idiot now, I guess that... Two, the girls had this coming. Boruto was actually, uh, would eventually let this go if it wasn't for Chojo and and hypocrite egging him on. I mean, Boruto would have let go of this if the pig and the hypocrite hadn't harassed him. And then there's the matter of the class rap. We find out that she is actually the villain of this saga and is the one behind the ghost attack. <clears throat> and the truth is, the only other time that this episode comes up is when Boruto is essentially convincing her not to blow up the Hidden Leaf Village because her and her classmates are friends. I mean, it's hard to believe that this doesn't come up in a future episode. Since... Since the ninjutsu battle of the sexes was won with an illegal weapon and technically stacked against the boys, the girl who won it was a criminal who a lot of the high-level ninjas were considering persecuting her as an adult. If it was that serious, then this girl, sh not only should she have been punished, but this should have come up and... All the girls at the Hidden Leaf Academy 
should have been either made subservient to the male students or expelled permanently, never to return, and to constantly get scolded by their parents permanently, never to return, and to constantly get scolded by their parents. Or at least Sarada and Chojo deserve to be expelled and never allowed to come back and get scolded by their parents. And then there's the fact that these guys who immobilize the girls with the earth style mud wall don't even try to slow them down. That's all they do. They don't jump in and block them to keep them from getting the flag. All the men in this episode were flanderized to make the women look better. Now, I'm going to give you somewhat of a list here of some of the retarded assholes who are responsible for this piece of garbage. Yukio here is a fucking retard. The producers of this show are complete trash. They are retards. And I really hope that they don't have kids. Because if they do, they might accidentally end up feeding them bleach. Because yes, they are that fucking stupid. This episode is living proof of it. This clown's name, who I know I would butcher, so I'm not going to say it. This clown should have been fired. And not only is the chief director a complete idiot, but everyone who was involved with this shit show should be ashamed of themselves. They should know better. I watch anime because it's usually better than the sexist bullshit on American TV. And one more thing. Boruto is part of the Naruto franchise which is a shonen anime. Shonen anime are written and pretty much produced for men and boys in the 11 to 35 year old demographic. So good on you, creators of Boruto! You just pissed off your target demographic! Uh, and one more thing. If you want something of satisfaction or a reason to why this episode of Boruto sucks so badly, take a look at the ending of a number of episodes of Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius. Because the truth is that... And you know, it's actually sad when the producers of Japanese anime, people who should know better, actually pull something like this when a show like Jimmy Neutron does it better. Because the truth is, in a lot of the early episodes, Cindy and Libby actually got punished whenever they did something asshole-ish. When they acted like assholes, they actually got punished at the end of the episode. There were consequences to their actions. Hello YouTube, Shadow Hero 90 here, and welcome to my show, Sexism in Movies and TV. 
You see, there is a reason why I do this show. Now, despite the fact that a lot of the stuff I review is for adults, a lot of the stuff I rip apart is aimed at kids. And truth be told, boys do not get good role models out of these shows. In fact, growing up on schlock like this actually runs the risk of your typical young man growing up with very low self-esteem and possibly coming to hate himself when he reaches adulthood. And that's why I do this show, to expose the hypocritical and unbelievable level of hatred thrown at both boys and men through both movies and TV, in the hopes of making a difference. Okay, in this episode of Sexism in Movies and TV, I'm going to be going over the episode The Chrissy. Like I said I would in the episode last year where I tore this cunt a new one. But before I get into the review, let me just say that in summer of 2018, I had a kidney stone. And it was painful as hell, and I'm still suffering from some of the effects to a small extent. You're probably wondering what that has to do with this episode. Well, I can't really say right now what it has to do with this episode, but I will bring up what it has to do with this episode when it becomes relevant. The episode starts with our four main boys and Cartman's so-called evil inner monologue, which actually isn't as evil as you'd think it is. So anyways, after his monologue, Cartman goes to the bathroom. Normally, what Cartman does is either evil or extremely immoral. But in this instance, he just wants to go to the bathroom. But Kyle and Craig are hogging it. And this apparently is a thing that happens often, which kind of forces Cartman's hand. He even says so, that he didn't want to do this, but they kind of drove him to it. So he puts on a bow with a ponytail on it, goes into the girl's room, and says that he's transgender. And since Cartman had been planning this, he knows exactly what to say to the principal when she calls him out on faking. Mr. Garrison, who was transgender at one point, knows that because of laws passed, they don't have a choice and they have to build Cartman his own personal bathroom. Wendy and the other cunts at South Park 
aren't really okay with this because until the bathroom is complete, Cartman is going to be using their bathroom, understandable, but because of the laws passed that Mr. Garrison brought up, it would probably be for the best that they just put up with it. Well, Cartman goes a little too far with the idea of having his own personal bathroom. Because Cartman does love his bathrooms. And this is actually where the episode had the potential to do something great and actually shine. It's like I said before, usually what Eric Cartman does is either evil or completely selfish and fueled by a sense of either greed or hedonism. But, in this case, his actions were coming out of a last resort. And this is where the episode truly bombs. Wendy pretty much dresses up like a boy and says she's transgender so she can have access to the transgender bathroom. And since Cartman is a straw man in this episode, he takes his rage out on Stan, telling him that he's dating a transgender and that he's a Chrissy, implying that he's potentially gay, and this screws up Stan. Forcing him to ask questions to his idiot dad about what's going on. About his feelings and if he's gay or not. What he doesn't know is, it, it's, the, it's just his bitch girlfriend doing this to make an idiotic point. This is the part of the review that makes the kidney stone that I had last year actually relevant. You see... When I was having that kidney stone, before I got, I, before I was able to leave and go to the hospital, I was in a lot of pain. And my sister was hogging the bathroom. If she had not been doing that, I actually could have relieved some of the pain and my little night of torture would not have been as painful as it was if I actually had access to the decent bathroom which I did not because my sister was hogging it. In this episode, I sympathize more with Cartman's plight of not having a toilet to use than I do with Wendy trying to make a point. Going As someone who went through a kidney stone, what Cartman's going through, at least to me, is very sympathetic. Wendy, on the other hand, is just acting like a massive cunt cuz she had to put up with it for a couple days. It's almost as if she can't remember all the times the boys suffered because of her jackassery. She is a terrible character. 
But that one scene was actually the moment where this episode could have done something right. The only change that Trey and Matt would have had to make would be have Kyle and Craig, the ones who are usually hogging it, dress up like girls, tell the principal that they're transgender, and essentially hog the transgender bathroom, showing Cartman that he can't pull stunts like this to get his own personal bathroom. That hypothetical scenario is this shit fest done right! Oh, and in the early days of South Park, when they had the running gag of killing Kenny off every episode, Trey and Matt should start doing that to Wendy. I mean, it's basically kill either kill off the good boy who's poor and well-meaning, or the spoiled girl who is a bitch and acts like a second-rate boy. Oh, and to end this review, I'm going to say something that it might make me some enemies, but I'm going to say it. Quagmire's dad is actually better than the Chrissy, because instead of just some asshole, or in this case two assholes, pretending to be transgender in order to get stuff for free, Quagmire actually ends up accepting and defending Ida, not only at the end of the episode, but in future episodes. Okay, in this episode of Sexism in Movies and TV, we'll be doing our second Bitch Monster segment. And originally, this was, this was supposed to go to the daughter of the family, Lisa. But that might take a little too long, and I decided to do her grandmother first. But yes, I will eventually get to Lisa Simpson. And with that said, let's start the review. They erected a tombstone for him, and he accidentally fell into his fake grave, where his mother finds him. After seeing his mother for the first time in 23 years, he brings her home to see the family. And this is where Abe Simpson's horrible parenting skills are brought into the picture. He'd rather tell his son that the boy's mother ran away after pulling some asinine jackass hippie stunt than letting this act of chivalry might explain why Homer never punishes Lisa and will let Marge off the hook after every asinine thing she does, regardless of how he has to pay for it. And it kind of portrays Mona as a spoiled ingrate. I mean, this man essentially works hard to support the family, and she goes and pulls this stunt. But Abe Simpson is a terrible father for not telling his son the truth. 
this woman truly does care about the planet, the environment, and feminism than her own son and the rest of the family. So anyways, at the end of the episode, Homer has his mom sent away when after Mr. Burns called the cops just so she doesn't have to face consequences to her actions. And it's weird that Homer doesn't actually convert into a sexist after this episode. Because if this happened to me, I would be viewing women as the scum of the earth. And, yeah, she doesn't come back until season 15. Okay, in the episode, My Mother the Carjacker, Homer starts becoming obsessed with newspapers. For some reason, I don't remember. He actually finds a message she planted in the paper to meet him again. They do meet and it looks like she might actually come home and become part of their family. But Mona is eventually arrested and put on trial. But for a reason I can't remember, she actually is found not guilty. And I'm not sure, but I think this is where Abe comes clean and says that it was better to tell her tell him that she died than tell him his mother was a convicted criminal. And this does pull Abe into the wrong. Now, it's clear that Homer has abandonment issues. That and the 1950s way that his father raised him essentially made it well, Homer kind of has a, a warped view of relationships. Like I said, he never punishes Lisa, and he lets Marge off the hook every time she does something screwed up. But when Mona uses one of her aliases to sign some sort of contract or something, I forget what it is. As Mr. Burns knew she would, the FBI shows up and arrests her. Yeah, um, people like to say Mr. Burns is a villain, but he's actually the hero of this episode as he's actually bringing an actual criminal to justice. Homer tries to break her out, but she does do the right thing, sacrificing herself to save Homer, which was the only good thing we saw her do throughout this episode. Homer thinks she's dead and kicks over Frank Grimes' tombstone. But then gets a message from her saying that she's alive. Which she is when she should be in jail. Mona returns one more time in the episode, Mona Leaves an A. This is the episode where this bitch dies. After coming home, 
one final time, Mona actually acts like she wants to spend time with her family. And surprisingly enough, for once in Homer's entire life, he actually acts realistically towards his mom. He's pissed at her. And I definitely see why. This jackass cared more about liberalism than her own son. And as she's looking at the photos, she actually sees what she did to him by leaving. So anyways, Mona dies for real this time. And she leaves behind stuff for the family to use in an actual stupid liberalism hippie mission that they actually go through with. The family actually goes through with. And this is actually surprising that Homer would do this. You see, Homer's doing this in memory of his mother. The mother who abandoned him and was the source of him turning into, or in this case, growing into a fat, bald, irresponsible wino. Also, she could run from responsibility and continue pulling hippie stunts. But his father is actually partly to blame, as he didn't tell Homer the truth. And it's kind of weird that Homer even honors the memory of his jackass mother who walked out on him and his father. I mean, logically, you'd think Homer, after learning about who his mother was, would actually try to piss her off And it's completely unrealistic that Homer is actually accepting of his mother until the second time she came back. I mean, logically speaking, if we are following the... Homer is Homer, technically... I mean, shouldn't Homer want to piss his mother off for running out on him? I'm just saying, if The Simpsons was not written with an anti-male agenda in mind, Homer would be constantly going through the episode Mona Leaves an A, trashing the environment, treating Marge like property, and doing anything he can that he knows would piss her off. And since Mona is such an environmentalist, so much so that she left her family for it, I could see Homer using, oh, say, I don't know, driving his car, ga guzzling gas, essentially doing anything he can to wreck the planet as a form of therapy. And since he knows that his mother was such a environmentalist, and she ran from responsibility because of an environmentalist stunt she pulled that was illegal. 
I don't see why Homer would turn to polluting the planet as a form of therapy. He has mommy issues. He can cope by essentially making as big a mess as humanly possible and raping the environment. Chopping, making sure that trees get chopped down. Having the entire family drive cars that would guzzle up gas and pollute the environment. And siding with Mr. Burns, the man who wanted Mona in jail in the first place, because he was the one she crossed. And in season 20, we find out that the fact that Abe and Mona's marriage was on the rocks is the reason that Homer's such a fat tub of lard now. Because he was burying his emotions in his food and eating them, or something to that extent. Just like in the last Bitch Monster segment, when I ripped up Wendy Testaberger, Mona Simpson also has a page on the Heroes Wiki website. Which kind of convinces me that the internet has no fucking clue what a hero is. Heroes do not break the law and run from responsibility. Heroes don't abandon their kids. And FYI for anyone living in the real world, hippies and feminists are not heroic. In short, Mona Simpson is a piece of trash. She's an absolute cunt. This bitch left her second born after giving her first born away. And she is the reason why Homer is as fucked up as he is. If she actually stayed in his life, Homer's life would be way different and he may be not even be with Marge who actually is the dysfunctional one in that relationship. And he might actually have kids who like him. And in ending this review, I'm just going to say that Mona Simpson is a prime example of why chivalry is bad. And I really hope it is dead. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Sexism in Movies and TV. And in this episode, I'm going to be tearing apart Matt Goring's latest cartoon, Disenchantment. And a lot I'm sure a lot of people assumed that this show would be the end of his career. Whether or not that's the case, when you look at the quality of this piece of shit, I wouldn't judge those people for assuming that. In at least one interview in the early 1990s, this man, Matt Goring, pretty much said, well, he didn't say it, but he referred to sitcoms of the 80s. In at least one interview in the early 1990s, this man, Matt Goring, pretty much said, well, he didn't say it, but he referred to 
sitcoms of the 80s as the zombification of the American family. Because shows like Elf, Different Strokes, Family Matters, and Full House embraced the nuclear family and American values, despite the fact that Full House did a PSA episode about child abuse where this idiot uses child abuse as a running gag in The Simpsons. When Futurama came out, he actually put Nibbler in the first episode, but not directly. He just put the shadow there, Nibbler's shadow, which was foreshadowing the fact that Nibbler shoved Fry into the cryogenic tube that would bring him to the 31st century. And in 2018, Matt Goring released Disenchantment, his latest work. People assume that it's going to be his last work because of how bad it is. And come on, everything I said prior. gives off the implication that this man hates lazy writing. But when going into his characters, he essentially makes his main character the Rebel Princess. In 2018, the Rebel Princess is lazy writing. <clears throat> now that I've gotten that unpopular opinion out of the way, it's time for me to rip apart the characters. And believe me, these are some real shit characters. Princess Bean. What can I say? This is a character archetype that is not only, like I said, lazy writing, but done a million times. If anything, Fiona from the Shrek movies is a way better version of this character. I mean, Beans, the only thing she has that could set her apart from the anti-princess trope is the fact that she's an alcoholic moron. And if we're following how Matt Goring writes all his characters, then it's basically just going to revolve around people telling her that she can't do this and must conform, and she finds a way to rebel and at the same time be in the moral right. I saw a clip from one of the episodes where she was supposed to make a diplomatic speech and she got drunk and ruined it. Everyone watching knew that would happen. I knew that would happen. And this is the character who will be suited by a bunch of male characters who are nothing more than straw men. And the fact that the only thing that separates Bean from all the other anti-princesses is that she gets drunk. 
And if I'm being honest, Bean just seems like, as well as a very good sign that Matt Goring doesn't know what in the world he's doing. Because this character has been done to death in way, way better shows and in video games. Next up on the chopping block is Elfo. In the first episode, they portray him as depressed, living in his home, which is... But the minute he's out of the Smurf Village, he becomes... They constantly have him introducing himself, you know, just to make him look stupider. And they kind of make you wonder. Surprisingly enough, they kill him off and don't bring him back. Which, yeah, that could go either way. I don't know, Matt Goring, but this is just potential. I'm not in any way saying that I do or confirming anything. Lucy, this guy was sent to make sure Bean always acted on her worst impulses, but she was into drinking, gambling, I don't know if she steals in the show, but most likely would have been okay with stealing and possibly killing people before this guy was assigned to turn her evil. So, in all fairness, this character's presence in the show is irrelevant. And then there's King Zog, Bean's father, who admitted that he... And then there's this chump one of Bean's suitors who gets turned into a pig because he's an egocentric, pompous douchebag like every one of her suitors because, yeah, that's how Matt Goring views all men. Well, not all men, just the ones who are stronger and smarter than him. And said pompous douchebag gets turned into a pig because that statement hasn't been done to death a million times. Oh, and they never turn him back into a human, but if Matt Goring wants to put his money where his big fat mouth is, he should end disenchantment with an episode where Princess Bean gets turned into a leech. And when you have the anti-princess cliché, Dumbass. 
Overall, this enchantment is a piece of crap. It's feminist propaganda, and none of the characters are written well. When The Simpsons first came out, Matt Goring said in an interview that he hated lazy writing. But this show is the laziest thing on Netflix. It pretty much revolves around, oh, how is Bean going to rebel against being a princess this week? And believe me, that gets old very fast. If Matt Goring truly was... against lazy writing and wanted this show to be good, he'd actually be deconstructing the rebel princess, anti-princess trope and explaining why it wouldn't work. And to end this review, I'm just going to say... The disenchantment is nothing but an overglorified piece of shit. It is by no means worthy of being the spiritual successor to Futurama. And all of this can be put on two factors. The character of Bean, who's horribly written and horrible in every other way, and series creator Matt Goring who has shown his true colors that, well, you know what I mean. He's not exactly what he claims to be. He's just a liberal beta bitch. Okay, in this episode of Sexism in Movies and TV, I will be reviewing the two-part episode, Operation Dude Rescue, from Teen Titans Go! This episode was sexist, but it did not in any way have to be. I will give you a rundown of the episode, and then after that, I'll give you an alternate version of the storyline Operation Dude Rescue, or in this case, an alternate version of what it tried to say that would have been much better. Then what we got. So the episode starts off with Robin, Cyborg, and Beast Boy essentially acting like gentlemen and acting real chivalrous to impress Raven and Starfire. For the first few minutes of the episode, it's annoying and disgusting, and that's kind of just all it is. Then it becomes a major league inconvenience for Raven and Starfire. As in, these three idiots put their jackets all over them, causing them to sweat. This isn't chivalry. This is just sheer stupidity. Okay, I'm pretty sure that this episode is trying to say that chivalry is outdated and stupid, but there is another way that they could have done this. And it not only would have been a lot better, but it would have gotten a lot better ratings, and this alternate version that I did promise would come at the end of the video 
would have pleased a lot of fans of the original Teen Titans series. And after spending the first few minutes of the episode being annoying and disgusting, essentially this episode about chivalry takes a different turn, which is actually more stereotypical when Robin, Cyborg, and Beast Boy's chivalry actually forces them to leave Raven and Starfire at Titan's Tower and preventing them from being superheroes. Robin, Cyborg, and Beast Boy fight the brain and they get beaten and captured. I know what this is. It's supposed to be a role reversal of the damsel in distress. The problem is, is that this joke, I've seen it a million times before. It isn't funny. It died in the late 1980s or early 1990s at the latest possible time. The idea of male heroes in peril and female characters having to come to their rescue is something that's been done to death. Whether or not you want to play it as a moral message or as a joke, this storyline has been done to death a million times. The joke is dead. And after Robin, Cyborg, and Beast Boy tell Raven and Starfire what happens, they laugh at them. Maybe they deserved it, maybe they didn't. All they wanted was to try and date one of these two. Why, I don't know. But, if you want to look at this through the lens that they got what they had coming to them, well, then it's kind of unbelievably hypocritical to view things in that manner. Because, if you want to think that this is toxic masculinity and that what Robin, Cyborg, and Beast Boy are doing is toxic, then by that logic, every single character that you're seeing flash across the screen is ten times as toxic because a lot of them, well, most of them, well, to most of them, getting a boyfriend is their entire character. Bulma here manipulated a small child into doing her fighting and other things for her just so she could get a boyfriend at the end of the first saga of Dragon Ball. I only saw 16 five times, but this character, from what I've seen of her, though those five times, most likely dated every male character on the show, but the relationship always went wrong when she found a flaw in him, or he wanted something, or didn't turn out to be perfect. Sakura obsessed over Sasuke while at the exact same time treating Naruto like shit, and this went on and on until the timeline of Boruto, Naruto the Next Generation. 
while Eno was just as bad, only she reformed a lot quicker. She actually stopped being a bitch halfway through Naruto Shippuden and actually became a decent person a lot faster than that bitch Sakura did. And the truth is, neither one of them ever faced consequences for how horribly they treated Naruto. Hinata was the only good character in Naruto Shippuden, but the time Boruto, Naruto the Next Generation rolls around, she's a complete bitch. Lori Loud here, in the first season of Loud House, obsessed over her boyfriend, almost to a religious degree, while at the same time treating her 11-year-old brother like shit. And Lenny Loud would really like a boyfriend, and she kind of actually wears a dress which I'm pretty sure Tumblr already sees is problematic. You know, a, a female character actually acting like a girl? But I digress. Raven and Starfire build a team of female heroes to save Robin, Cyborg, and Beast Boy. I don't know why... I mean, the three characters they picked to recruit were villains. If they had any sense, I mean, because these three could easily turn on them at a moment's notice. If anything, they should have went to the Justice League for help. You know, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Green Lantern. But no, because of a feminist message, they needed three female characters, but since they were the only two female heroes on the show, they had to recruit three villains, just because they were female. The male titans fail to escape time and time again. They use a time machine, blah blah blah. They can't get out. They end up creating a bunch of alternate timelines because of the time machine. There's a caveman version of the Titans. Because, yeah, chivalry is outdated. We get it. Stop hammering your stupid comment in. The girl characters defeat the brain. And then they attempt to rescue Robin, Cyborg, and Beast Boy. And I get it. It's a gender-swapped damsel in distress scenario. Nintendo's done it before. And everyone calls Princess Peach nothing more than a problematic princess. But then Cyborg offers Raven her jacket, and because chivalry be dead, the girls just leave them there and have Girls Night Out 5 where they go out for Sundays. Man, this episode is fucked up on so many levels. Yes, I agree, chivalry is bad. But it goes in the opposite direction. I mean, it goes both ways. It's not a one-way street. Okay, now you're probably all wondering about a hypothetical version of this episode that would be a lot better. Well, the better version of Operation Dude Rescue essentially starts out in the same exact way.
Cyborg, Robin, and Beast Boy all pull the same exact chivalrous crap. They would make the speech about chivalry. Raven would say that chivalry is dead, like in the actual episode. Robin, Cyborg, and Beast Boy, instead of getting Girls Night Out 4, Robin, Cyborg, and Beast Boy are bailed out of the brain's clutches either by accident or because Raven and Starfire asked this of this mysterious hero to save the three chumps. And this is a character that fans of the original Teen Titans would love to see appear in Teen Titans Go. And this mysterious anti-hero is none other than Red Axe. Yes, he would be the one who would bail out Robin, Cyborg, and Beast Boy from the Brain's Lair. So anyways, as this alternate version of Operation Dude Rescue continues, Raven and Starfire decide to teach Robin, Cyborg, and Beast Boy a lesson by essentially pretending to have a massive crush on Red X. Both of them would essentially fake being head over heels in love with this guy on screen. This one. The one on the screen. So anyways, then Robin, Cyborg, and Beast Boy would essentially copy Red X, and Raven and Starfire would call them out for being cheap knockoffs. But by that point, Raven and Starfire actually would have developed a crush on Red X, and then Raven can deliver her big speech about chivalry being dead. And the episode would end with Starfire declaring that she actually does have a crush on Red Axe, even though her and Raven were faking it at first. And the episode would just end with Raven and Starfire fighting over Red Axe. So please, tell me in the comments whether or not you prefer the fake version of this episode that I wrote over the actual version, Operation Dude Rescue. Okay, in this episode of Sexism in Movies and TV, I'm going to be reviewing the Simpsons episode, Bart Gets Hit by a Car. Now, you may not really think that this episode is all that sexist, but... Let me first just give you a little rundown of the episode. While skateboarding, 
Mr. Burns accidentally hits Bart with his car. Then Bart has a dream in which he goes to heaven or is going to heaven disobeys the rule by spitting over the escalator down to earth and is instantly sent to hell. Bart did claim to be innocent and this is all just a dream. Bart Simpson did claim to be innocent, and this is all just a dream. But when you take a look at the look on his face, he's kind of terrified. He even says, mm, say, is there anything I can do to avoid coming back here? I mean, he, he, he actually wants to get out of going back to hell. He is that terrified of this. Even though it's all just a dream, and everything he's experiencing is just coming from his subconscious. Then the Simpsons meet corrupt attorney Lionel Hutz who offers to represent them in court and sue Mr. Burns, but they turn down his offer. Homer admits that he would have gone through with it if he wasn't so spineless. Mr. Burns offers Homer a check for $100. But when Homer brings up Bart's medical bills, Mr. Burns accuses him of extortion and takes back the check for a mere $100 declaring that he has the finest lawyers in town and would crush Homer if he tried to sue him. Homer gets pissed off and recruits Lionel Hutz. And so the trial commences and the Simpsons are actually winning. Homer and Lionel Hutz have Bart tell the story from their point of view, exaggerated, an exaggerated point of view. And Mr. Burns has his lawyer tell his own exaggerated version of what happened. The Simpsons are still winning. Mr. Burns' lawyers advise him to go for a settlement, so he invites Marge and Homer over to his house. And instead of going for the cash settlement, Mr. Burns only offers them $500 with a smiley face drawn underneath it. But this was all a trick as Mr. Burns and Smithers are spying on them. Homer gets pissed off because they all know that Burns was going to lose the case and have to pay them a million dollars. And then that idiot Marge brings up the shifty lawyer and the phony doctor. 
So then Mr. Burns comes out and tells them that they're not getting anything from him after he ran over their son. I got a weird feeling that if he had run over Lisa, this episode would be going the exact opposite route. Later, at the final hearing, Marge is called to the stand, and after everything that's happened, you'd think she'd be willing to take one for the team after everything Mr. Burns had done, but no, she tells the truth. Homer's pissed off that Marge cost him a million dollars, Homer goes to Moe's. Marge shows up and Homer forgives her. Okay, now one thing that The Simpsons is criticized about or was criticized about in the early 21st century is essentially how fucked up Homer and Marge's relationship is. I mean, he lost a million dollars. His idiot wife cost him a million dollars. Essentially, in a trial where they were suing the old man who hit their son with a car. Now, I understand that this episode could easily be poking fun at trials in which both parties try to sh tell the events from their own point of view, but come on. Hitting a kid with your car, then trying to say that he was a punk who deserved it, then essentially insulting his parents with a lame settlement and spying on them, which is illegal, by the way. This completely puts Mr. Burns in the wrong. Marge should have taken one for the team, lied, and, and essentially gotten a million dollars from this asshole, the one who, who's the only one in this episode who deserves to suffer. I mean, just take a look at the look on her face. Even she's pissed at him. She thinks that this whole ordeal made Homer greedy. And you know what? She's still morally in the wrong. Sometimes you gotta hit people as hard as they're willing to hit you. Okay, I want anyone watching to tell me in the comments, is getting a little greedy in a lawsuit where you're suing someone rich and you have to go for a few low blows worse than... Oh, I don't know, say, getting mad at him for dancing with an attractive woman and throwing him out of the house when she herself was considering having an affair less than, oh, I don't know, 36 hours ago? What about taking advantage of her boyfriend's love for her by having him get a job he hates only to end up dumping him 
so that she can date her cultural history professor. A liberal douchebag who sees the Founding Fathers as evil, and, but he, this pervert has no... He has actually no morals whatsoever. This guy was willing to date one of his own students. And even though they were in college, a, I'm pretty sure a teacher dating a student is illegal and could cost him his job. That in itself is greedy. So I guess we can throw hypocrisy onto the pile as well. Another thing that is by no means as evil as, oh, getting a little greedy during a lawsuit is the fact that Marge broke up with Homer to date one of her teachers who had no intentions of settling down like Homer would have. Just imagine how this douchebag would have reacted when he found out Marge was pregnant. He would have essentially gone out of his way to run to either Canada or Mexico or as far away from the United States as humanly possible. And then he admits that he only got tenure, well that he didn't get tenure because the department head is an idiot. Actually, the head of his department is smart for denying this pervert tenure. If anything, Marge might have known about the pregnancy and might have tried to fool this pervert into thinking he was Bart's real father. In all fairness, um, every thing in the episode that 90s show outside of Marge Simpson's redemption at the end is far worse than getting a little greedy during a lawsuit. I mean a million times worse. Coupled with everything Marge has done after season 19. In all fairness, I know that this is season 2, but Homer and Marge have been together for more than a decade. If I were in Homer's position, I would just get right up there and deck Marge in the face. With what I just said, it's hard to believe that Marge didn't know about the pregnancy and was coaxing her teacher along with the hopes that he'd marry her and essentially become Bart's father without knowing the fact that he's not really his father, but... The only reason she didn't is that after hearing his thoughts on marriage, she knew that if she told this guy that she was pregnant and he was the father, he would have ran for the hills. Which is... Uh, the only reason she even went back to Homer because she wanted to be supported and didn't want to get slut shamed even though Marge Simpson deserves it. So yeah, um, what Homer's doing was by no means the equivalent of anything Marge did. And speaking of Bart, this is the real final big time kick in the balls that this episode gives you. At dinner, 
after the trial ended, Bart actually admits that he would have wanted to win the lawsuit. He says, you know what would have been really cool? If we got that million bucks. And Marge just says, Bart, please. In all fairness, this is just damn hypocritical. I mean, Bart Simpson, despite the fact that they try to write him as a genuine horse's ass who doesn't listen to any authority whatsoever, and they try to write Marge as this holier-than-thou, sympathetic, and tragic character, I can see events like this being the reason why Bart wouldn't listen to authority, especially her. Because every time that he listens to his idiot mother, he gets fucked over by it! But this ending is quite the insult. I mean, if they wanted to give this episode a good ending, this would not be it. The good ending to this episode would be Homer bringing Marge to Moe's every night and having her dance naked as well as Homer charging some of the drunk bums at Moe's to grope Marge until she's made the one million dollars. And then Homer and Bart split it. That would be a good episode. That would be a good ending to this crap fest. But no, this worm takes her back. And saying he loves her more than ever only shows how spineless he is and how insulting the goddamn dumbass dad trope is. That's it. Review over. In January of last year, I reviewed the episode of Super Sentai, Suddenly a Traitor, as the 23rd episode of Sexism in Movies and TV. And in this episode, I'm going to be reviewing another episode from the Super Sentai series and comparing it to that one. The episode in question is from Super Sentai Mega Ranger titled, Very Bad, We Will Die. And like in the last episode of Sexism in Movies and TV, I'm going to give a short little recap before I go into the comparison. This episode starts with the Mega Rangers as their secret identities eating teriyaki. When suddenly a moth monster flies around spreading poisonous powder. The Mega Rangers show up. Fight the moth monster and later that night the five members of Mega Ranger are called into their base. 
they see these marks which are essentially proof that they've been infected with a poison that's going to kill them. Miho, aka Mega Pink, sees a wedding dress and this brings up the fact she always wanted to get married and decide and well Kenta Mega Red is stuffing his face he runs into a boy he knows who tells him about a new fighting game coming into the arcade and wanting to play this game with that boy allows him to come to the conclusion that he can't give up hope and has to keep fighting. The chief calls in and tells them that if they can chop off a piece of the moth's body, they can make a cure from it. Even though they said it would merely be a chance, after everything they witnessed, the inspiration for them to regain hope, they decided to take it. <clears throat> so anyways, they chop off a part of the moth monster's body and take it back to the chief and him and the lab boys will essentially make an antidote from uh, that part of the moth's body. The antidote is made. And the doctor gives them the antidote. Mothman here gets big and then the Mega Rangers kill him with their giant robot. Recap adjourned. Okay, now I'm gonna explain through a comparison why very bad we will die from Super Sentai Mega Ranger worked where suddenly a traitor from Super Sentai O Ranger did not and get all of the reward while the chief doesn't get anything. And it probably is in bad taste to have the members who save the day only be able to fight the bad guy because they, you know, skipped work. Well, on the other hand, if these guys ever skipped work, they'd get chewed out and be called lazy. I watch shows like this because they usually don't have such a goddamn leftist, pathetic, double standard. And if you want the truth, the episode of Mega Rangers that I compare this episode to is suddenly a traitor done right! Hello, and welcome to Sexism in Movies and TV. In this episode, I'm going to be reviewing the episode of The Simpsons, Marge Be Not Proud. And hopefully you'll get a little preview in this review as to what the season finale is going to be about. You know, what I'm going to be reviewing in that episode. Okay, I'm just going to get this out of the way. 
If you've ever been on my channel, you would know that an episode like this really pisses me off. And not just because it, well, you know, violates continuity and you'll see where I'm coming from if you saw my last Simpsons review. So, anyways, the episode starts with Bart and Lisa watching Krusty's Christmas Special. When it instantly cuts to a commercial for the meta video game Bonestorm 2, which is a parody of Mortal Kombat. Bart sees it and is instantly in love. I'm just going to point out here that he's more in love with this video game that he does not own than he was with Jessica Lovejoy. And believe me, this episode is going to go out of its way to portray Bart Simpson is a weak-willed jackass. And then strokes Lisa's ego, implying that she's smarter than her older brother, which she's not if you actually pay attention to continuity, by making her look bored at the Bone Storm commercial. But believe me, if this were an advertisement for something about ponies, she'd be acting the same way Bart is. And the commercial instantly has him drooling. Bart asks his parents to buy it for him. But Marge says that video games cost up to 70 bucks. And at this point, um, they're already cutting the bullshit. This fat slob here dr goes to a bar and gets drunk every night. I'm pretty sure that $70 is not that cheap for this fat guy or this dumb bitch to afford, especially since this guy has a very well-paying job and when you look at how he got that job in the episode Maggie Makes Three, it was almost an act of blackmail. Now, if Homer was working three jobs and they were trying to make ends meet through that, then this story would actually make sense. But I don't see a video game that costs $70 essentially being that expensive. Okay, so Bone Storm is apparently a really big deal to all sorts of video game addicts. Even Millhouse has a copy. <clears throat> and going so far as to make this video game essentially a reference to Maxwell in itself is making it like this Mortal Kombat 2 parody is a lot more fun than it is. Millhouse claims that he's loving this and all he did was punch in his name. 
which isn't even his real name. Then Bart comes over and asks if he can play. Milhouse obviously knows what Bart's up to. So he lies and says that it's a one-player game. Bart then says that there's a second player score, and in response, because Milhouse is being such a little baby that he doesn't want to share, causing him to get thrown out of the of Milhouse's house. Okay, at this point, Bart is pretty much losing his mind over this, and thinks that maybe if he stands next to the game looking sad, someone will buy it for him, which at this point is just goddamn pathetic. Okay, and to add insult to injury, Bart actually sees a kid who's a spoiled brat and treats his mom worse than he treats Marge, essentially get a copy of Bone Storm 3, insult her to her face, and admit that he has Bone Storm Bone Squad, and, bo and already has a copy of Bone Storm 2. Then Bart runs into a couple of the school bullies who brag about, the about their successful attempts at shoplifting. Nelson then tells him that shoplifting is a victimless crime, which is not true in any sense of the word. Now, Bart Simpson is losing his mind over this, like I said. But now, he's gone so far into insanity that he's hallucinating video game mascots telling him to steal a copy of Bone Storm. Mario tells him to shoplift, as does his brother. Donkey Kong comes in and I'm going to put his little comment on hold so I can rip it apart afterwards. And then Sonic shows up and tells Bart to just take the copy of Bone Storm and commit an act of theft, which is something I could definitely see Sonic the Hedgehog doing. And apparently, Sonic's, um, quote-unquote, hip style is apparently supposed to convince Bart to take a copy of Bone Storm without paying for it. Which he does. But now I'm going to rip apart Donkey Kong's. Statement. Donkey Kong's words are, and I quote, It's the company's fault for making you want it so much. Which is bull and shit. The Santa in this commercial is a fucking badass. I mean, he shoots the game cartridge into the console using a bazooka. Even his reindeer are terrifying. I mean, look at the scared lo looks on those kids' faces. They're terrified of those things. 
And overall, those kids look really happy to be playing that game. The blunt version is, it's not the company's fault for making Bart want this as much as he does. If he wants it as much as he does, that's only proof that the company did their job right and, are go and that they're good at it. It's not their fault that Bart eventually ends up shoplifting. So Bart takes a copy of Bone Storm, i.e. steals one, makes it outside in one piece and thinks he got away with it. But admitting it out loud was his essentially downfall as he was then caught by mall security. And I was wrong when I, when I said that this kid's first appearance was to add insult to injury. Her son treats her like crap and she said that that boy's parents made some terrible mistakes. What mistakes? Not getting him a violent video game? I'm actually seeing this, and actually, something just occurred to me. It's almost as if this episode is actually endorsing what Bart Simpson just did. Yeah, I I'm gonna go with that. This episode wants us to feel bad for this shoplifter because the game looked fun. So anyways, um, after the commercial break, the security guard drags Bart through the store and I'm assuming this is supposed to be a walk of shame moment. Seeing as how he gets shamed by, by the guy in the Santa Claus outfit. And dragged to uh, the guard's office. The guard shows him a documentary about shoplifting, which goes nowhere. So then the security guard calls Homer and Marge and tells them what happened. And then he tells Bart that if he ever sets foot in Shop and Save again, that he's going to see to it that Bart Simpson spends Christmas in Juvenile Hall. So anyways, Bart Simpson races home on his bike just so he can switch the tape to both avoid getting in trouble and to set up a climax. So anyways, he switches the tape just to avoid getting in trouble. Later the next day, Marge informs the family that they're going to get their family family Christmas photos taken. And when Bart hears that it's going to happen at the try and save, you know, the place he tried to steal from, he actually starts hallucinating again, like when he was completely video game crazed. 
he actually starts hallucinating again. Like when he was completely video game crazed. And the threat that the guard gave him actually causes him to have a sick fantasy about spending Christmas in Juvenile Hall where he gets a soiled wig for Christmas while everyone else gets cooler stuff than him. Bart tries to disguise himself, but it fails as Marge removes the disguise. The fear of getting caught actually starts to eat up Bart even more as he continues to hallucinate. And it's almost like he has post-traumatic stress disorder because he's hallucinating at an alarming rate. Almost as if the closer he gets to the try and save, the more and more he's going to hallucinate. Despite whether or not that sounded funny, that's not where I was going with it. It definitely was not funny. Or not intended to sound funny. Homer forces Bart into the try and save as Bart dodges the security cameras. And Homer acts like a cheapskate saying now she'll really be surprised when she opens that ironing board cover after he saw Marge fawning over a watch. Which is actually kind of ironic, since the last time I reviewed this show, it kind of... Was it displayed in an insanely cartoonish amount and, and a toxic amount at that, how deeply in love Homer is with Marge, even though it's shown that he has a problem and that their relationship is definitely a toxic one. So, they're about to take the photo, pulls the pacifier out of Maggie's mouth, which causes her to cry, and the photographer tries doing a funny voice to get her to smile, until the point that when the goddamn picture is taken, it has... So, anyways, then the, the guard tells Homer and Marge, because they're stupid, of the screen saying that he didn't want Marge to see this. And then he fesses up to what he did. And for some reason, Marge is actually ashamed, even though this actually could have been avoided. Believe it or not, in the Simpsons continuity involving this episode, this actually could have been avoided, and Marge is the sole reason that it wasn't, but I'll get to that after the episode review. So, in my statement, Marge is a shit mother and she doesn't deserve to be proud. So, after the commercial break, Homer essentially acts like a bad father, trying to give his son a lecture, but can't do it because he's an idiot. Okay, so Bart tries to apologize, 
But Marge just sits there traumatized. Marge is upset over what happened in bed, while Homer just acts like a blithering ape who's a bad father, and she wonders if she mothers him too much. So, not only is she gonna com- she gonna- So, the next day, Bart asks Milhouse if he thinks it's possible for- And then, when Milhouse says he's not worried, um, the big question comes up as to- He tells him that he got sick of it, and now he rather prefers playing with a cup and ball. This kind of comes off as bullshit, and Bart wants- He yells down to his mom, lying to her, telling her that Bart was smoking, which he wasn't. As if to add insult to injury, this actually happens. Mrs. Van Houten is about to throw Bart out of her house, but this is kind of something she wanted. I mean, she's getting a surrogate son in a way, and so anyways, Bart comes home and realizes that they made a snowman family without him. And they let him make a Bart snowman with the lame gray snow under the car. They leave, and Bart makes, or at least tries to make one of him, and it fails. Bart's pissed at his family until he runs into Nelson Muntz. Now, Bart is convinced that the family now sees him as the black sheep and decides he's gonna prove them wrong. Now, I want you to think about those words. Black sheep. Haley Smith from American Dad is a black sheep. Meg Griffin from Family Guy is a black sheep. But their families still love them regardless. This behavior doesn't say you're a black sheep. This behavior says we don't want you. Now, Bart does do the right thing by retaking his picture and letting Marge see it, and he tries to surprise her with it, but she instantly assumes he was shoplifting again. And Bart gets an early Christmas gift, which is just the crappy putting challenge video game. Okay, now that the episode review is over, I'm actually going to explain how this is chronologically Marge's fault. Remember how in the beginning of the episode she says that these games cost up to $70? If Marge had actually done what Homer wanted her to do in the episode Bart gets hit by a car, where he got hit by a car, then the whole $70 wouldn't even be an issue. 
Not to mention the fact that this, the whole them suing Mr. Burns for a million dollars, is actually what Bart wanted. He wanted to win that case. Marge, if anything, is the reason why they could not afford a copy of Bone Storm. And in a way, she contributed to Bart eventually breaking down and shoplifting. Now, with everything that happened in the episode, <coughs> I'm just going to say this now. The ending was by no means worth it. Bart didn't get a copy of Bone Storm, nor does he deserve it. And I actually thought up of two different ways that this episode could end that would have been better than the way it did. But they would have to be series finales. W ending one, Mrs. Van Houten adopts Bart and he becomes a better son than Milhouse ever was. And two, the Simpsons actually take Bart to therapy, acknowledge that he has a problem, and essentially cure him of his video game addiction, while at the same time making sure that he never plays video games ever again. Now, I'm sure we can all agree that shoplifting is wrong. And people, on, people are always saying that after season 8, The Simpsons went downhill. But I have no clue what this is poking fun at. Shoplifting? Shoplifting is stealing, and they all and they went after that one in the episode Homer versus Lisa. I have no choice but to assume that what their what this episode is meant to say is that Bart was in the right. In that Marge is such a bad parent, he stooped down to stealing, even though she could have bought him the game and this never would have happened. It's a grotesque glorification of video game addiction, something that if you've seen my channel is not funny, and they're not only poking fun at it, but they're portraying it as a good thing. Because if this episode wanted to have a moral or say anything about society or even have a purpose, let me just start off by saying I do not like this show. My hatred went so far as to, uh, you know, cause me to create an anti-brony slash My Little Pony hate playlist on my channel. And yes, I am very happy that it was cancelled. Now, I did not watch the episode Dragon Quest of My Little Pony. I'm doing this review, but I am not watching this piece of horse shit. No pun intended. I only heard about it in passing, but I'm 
pretty sure I can easily assume what it'll be about and give you an abridged, you know, review of what happens and why. Okay, so when this little runt is told that he doesn't act like other dragons, he decides to leave and make some friends who are dragons. He then gets bullied and made fun of by the other dragons and eventually goes running home to the ponies and the ponies most likely then do something to the dragons to get back at them. The end. And, yeah, that's kind of the review. But I would like to bring up something else. As the these mythological animals are, in this case, metaphors for genders. The ponies are clearly metaphors for girls, and the dragons are metaphors for boys. And believe me, this does not go over well. It essentially tells little girls that all men are jerks. And that is something, well, that leads into what I want to bring up next. And is going to be the bulk of this video. And that would be Lauren Faust, a veteran in the animation industry, as well as an outspoken feminist. Which, I'm going to say, letting her have control over this as a feminist was a very bad idea on Hasbro's part. My Little Pony is supposed to be a show that teaches girls about morals. Now, having a feminist write that show is an idiotic move. Well, not so much write, but produce it, maybe write it, and have complete creative control. I'm not exactly sure what her role was when this began, but it was a very large and powerful one. <clears throat> This show also gave rise to the brony phenomenon, and I am about 90% sure that that is exactly why Miss Faust decided to leave. When she found out how toxic the fandom of her show had become, and the, psych the psychopathic things they were doing. I am 90% sure that that's why she left, because feminists never want to take accountability for their actions. They want, well, the power and authority, but with that comes responsibility. And when your fan base is essentially just a group of sociopaths, and little girls kind of give the impression that these sociopaths took the show away from them and ruined it for them, it would make sense that, since it was a feminist who wrote this, she would leave to avoid taking responsibility for her actions. Now, you're probably thinking that what I'm saying is bullshit. It is not. I actually heard somewhere that this woman saw the original and wanted to reboot it 
even though she had something else in mind that she was going to work on, but chose this instead because she thought the original My Little Pony was too girly. For shit's sake, it's a cartoon based off My Little Pony. It's supposed to be girly. It's supposed to appeal to little girls. You want to know what logic this falls on? I'll tell you with a simple metaphor. Let's say, hypothetically, in the 2030s, um, we get a, re a remake of Adventure Time. Now, the man who's going to be in complete control of this remake is, will have been described as a men's rights activist who had been divorced three times. And then, in the first season or two, we get stuff like um, Finn killing Marceline the first night they meet, and season one ending with Finn coming to the realization that Princess Bubblegum will never date him and that she's evil. And in response, Finn kills her. Now, you're probably wondering where all that would come from. Throughout the first season of this hypothetical Adventure Time remake, Bubblegum would have been portrayed as a self-centered, greedy little bitch who only thinks about herself and they'd step, they would take her from, they would take her from where she would normally have been in the original season one, but she'd be written like season six or seven bubblegum, where she's just a complete bitch with no redeeming qualities whatsoever. And hypothetically, when this adventure, this hypothetical Adventure Time remake enters its next season, um, it would actually be Princess Bubblegum who becomes the Lich and tries to kill Finn and Jake over it because Finn found out Bubblegum was evil, decided he was going to kill her in a fit of rage, and the, the entire show would want you to side with Finn in this hypothetical scenario. And... Not to mention that if this happened, we might see something like an alternate version of Adventure Time where Finn and Jake are constantly pointing out that Lumpy Space Princess is stupid and they'd be calling her stuff like Circus Clown, Idiot, Jackass, right to her face. But anyways, back on topic. Um, then, the guy who developed this Adventure Time remake for Cartoon Network essentially leaves after feminist groups are livid about this and are calling the show misogynistic and that the media blames this Adventure Time remake for a sudden uprise of boys bullying girls at school. 
that's, I mean, just switch boys with girls in Adventure Time with My Little Pony, and that's exactly what Lauren Faust did, or at least what I'm pretty sure she did. So, anyways, I'm going to end this episode of Sexism in Movies and TV by saying, My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, is a cartoon that's meant to teach girls morals. And it failed in ways no one could even start to imagine. Okay, begin scene. Bart Simpson walks up to Ashley Graham, who is babysitting him and his siblings, and says, So you're one of those chicks, huh? Ashley Graham responds by saying, Don't call me a chick. Lisa then throws in, Sorry about my unenlightened brother. He will make the next few hours a living hell. Ashley then pulls out a video game. Bart stands there in awe, like an idiot. And she tells him if he does some homework, she'll let him play for five minutes. Bart says it isn't worth it, but he lacks the willpower to fight back. And then Ashley says, You see, Lisa, males aren't hard to tame. They all follow their video cartridges, as she makes Bart slam himself into a wall. Now, in all fairness, I know this is meant to be over-the-top satire, but this scene alone makes me feel no sympathy for this cunt. I know that this is supposed to be a parody of a scandal that happened on a show, I think it was called Hard Copy. Begin scene. The Planet Express crew has just returned to Earth after a rock alien swapped their genders. Female Hermes wants to cuddle, but her husband says he has to get up five times a night to play Xbox. In this episode of Sexism in Movies and TV, I am going to be attacking the video game addiction trope. The harmful stereotype that all men are video game addicts, or at least play video games. Growing up, I was always offended by this. I don't play video games. In fact, I actually view video games in a very negative manner, and being mature for my age, I never really saw what was so fascinating about video games. In fact, from what I saw from TV, um, video games were essentially a poison. Not to mention the fact that my interactions at school with those who played video games was never good. To me, the fan base for video games, especially the Sonic fanboys, 
was them being just a bunch of immature, retarded, egocentric jackasses. A month ago, I reviewed the episode Marge Be Not Proud, in which Bart is so obsessed with a video game that he resorts to stealing. The Simpsons had already taught that stealing was wrong, and at this point, I have no clue what they're poking fun at, but that's beside the point. That review was essentially meant to be a setup for this episode. And since I already reviewed that episode, I'm going to be reviewing four episodes of the sh of a, a certain cartoon starring the most heinous immature and obnoxious video game addict of all time Johnny Test Oh and before I start reviewing let me just say this son of a bitch is the perfect example of, in a sense, how I kind of saw narcissistic, full of himself, greedy, entitled, and not to mention thinking about video games to the exclusion of nothing else, and you would have a very good idea of how I saw the video game fandom in the 1990s all the way up to the 2010s. Johnny Test would be a perfect example of that. Him and the unicorns from the episode of regular show, the unicorns have got to go. So anyways, on with the review. Okay, in the episode Fat Johnny, the latest Smash Badger game had come out. So Johnny goes to the game store and trades in all his games for the latest copy and when the clerk tells him that he doesn't have enough credit to get Smash Badger but he does have credit, enough credit to get, uh, I forget the name of whatever he had the credit to get, but it was a parody of Dance Dance Revolution, and he said that it combines girly dancing with exercise, so to insult him, because remember, Johnny's an entitled prick. He calls the clerk fat and makes fun of his weight. So anyways, Dookie warns Johnny about karma. <clears throat> but Johnny still wants money to buy the new Smash Badger game. So he makes a deal with Bling Bling Boy to test out his latest invention, which actually Johnny ends up inheriting Bling Bling's DNA and becoming fat. He then heads over to the game store 
in which the clerk gets his revenge by com um then Susan and Mary make him into a rapper and he gets lots of money but is still unable to and after Dookie spent the episode going on and on about karma every time Johnny Test lost his money or an opportunity to play video games he runs into these two Girl Scouts who are taking uh, donations to help kittens and Johnny actually rejects them at first showing how greedy and self-centered he is but then eventually cracks realizes Dookie is right and gives the Girl Scouts his money which somehow returns him to normal. I haven't seen the episode in a very long time. So, this is an abridged review. In fact, all four are going to be abridged. because it has been over 15 years since I've seen most of this crap. So anyways, the next episode up on the cho chopping block, in case you haven't already figured it out, is Johnny Mon. The episode follows the standard um, going into a game rules that you have to win in order to go back. And because the plot of this piece of crap is rushed, they end up in the final round of the tournament battling Blast Ketchup, who's a parody of Ash Ketchum, and in which Johnny gets the latest Tiny Mon game, and this time Blast Ketchum has them pulled into his world. He captures Johnny's dad and Dookie somehow and tells them that if they ever want them, if they want them back, they have to battle him for them. And, yes. I understand this is a parody of Pokemon, and writing the character who's supposed to be a hero as a villain would work, but then Johnny and his sisters try to cheat in the battle by stealing um, the storage cubes that Blast Ketchum has, only for him to have anticipated that during the rematch and switched them himself. They go home, and Blast Ketchum ends up getting teleported back with them. The end. Okay, in the last Johnny Test episode, on the chopping block, but believe me, this episode is far from over, is past and present Johnny. In this episode, Johnny Test finds out that his dad used to play video games, but doesn't because of some traumatic event when he was a teenager. So Johnny Test, being the douchebag that he is, 
goes back to the past to fix the event, but creates a reality where his mom is married to the bully's dad, his genius sisters are now stupid, but somehow that time machine tea house that they used to travel back to the 80s somehow still exists. And he and Dookie are about to cease to exist unless they return to the 80s and let everything play out the way it did. And even though that's what they do, Johnny Test's dad plays video games again, so this asshole got what he wanted. And they somehow messed reality up. The page for the Just One More Level trope on tvtropes.org. And believe me, I get a lot of examples out of this one. Apparently, there's an episode of Friends where Schindler becomes addicted to Miss Pac-Man to the point where he can't move his hand anymore. And yeah, um, since this is a sitcom, People kind of, you know, play this off for laughs. Apparently there was an a an <clears throat> Apparently there was an episode of Angel in which the character Spike gets addicted to Crash Bandicoot. <clears throat> and, well, in an episode of Star Trek, a woman actually does introduce Riker to video games, and he becomes addicted. And this actually kind of is a kick in the nuts to all to everything I've been saying, because it basically implies that if a woman is around video games, she's not going to have much of a reaction whatsoever. But if a man even comes within three inches of a video game, he's going to develop an unhealthy obsession with it. And the last one I was able to get off this site is the most insulting of all. In one episode of Frasier, Nellie's or Niles or however you pronounce his name gets addicted to his nephew's video game simply because he couldn't beat the tutorial level. Okay, and to end this review, I'm going to be ripping apart an episode that comes from a way better show than Johnny Test, and that would be Grand Theft Arland from King of the Hill. Okay, the episode starts out with well, essentially, um, the, the Arlen School gets this, um, new thing where they want more computers in class. And since video games and game design technically falls under that curriculum, Bobby ends up in a class where he's just sitting on his ass all day playing video games. Hank doesn't like it. 
he complains, and then the man teaching the class makes the game propane as the means of making fun of Hank. Hank's boss, Buck Strickland, makes Hank play through the game just to see whether or not there was something in there that was a breach of copyright that they could sue over. Hank plays through the game but doesn't find anything they could use to sue the designer of the game over and boom! He's instantly addicted. Hank essentially lets this addiction take over his life to the point where propane, the game, is the only thing that matters to him. And to give us, well, to give the men in the audience one more kick in the balls, Peggy is the one to come in with the solution by essentially having the game hacked and creating an all-powerful character to come in and kill Hank's character, thus breaking him free from the trance. And that's where the episode ends. In closing, Bart Simpson, Hank Hill, and especially Johnny Test are not the everyman. There's this insane media depiction that every man is essentially addicted to playing video games, and that's just not true. Some men like comic books, some men like sports, some men like their jobs. I mean, come on, men are the ones who built the goddamn modern world. Without men, the population of Earth would still be in the Stone Age.